glasses. Hello and welcome to Global well. Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton. Um, today we're going to be Skyping in uh, from the center of Southeast Asia, Singapore, talk with an old friend of mine, Dr. Bernard Liu, uh, at the RSIS uh, Think Tank in Singapore. So without further ado, welcome to Think Tech, Bernard. Hi, Pat. Good to have you on the show. Uh, so, tell me a little bit about yourself uh, before we get started. I always like to have my guests introduce themselves. Uh, sort of, how did they get to what they're doing? Well, um, I started out as a university student thinking I wanted to do political philosophy, and in particular, Marxist political philosophy. Um, somewhat inconveniently, the Cold War ended, <laughs> and nobody was interested in a student in Marxist political philosophy. Um, However, strategic studies was something that I was quite interested in, and I decided to go for that for the moment. Um, that's how I ended up doing this, doing this job. So today I'm an associate professor at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies. I teach courses on defense policy, um, strategy and war, and intelligence and national security. And you did part of your, your studies uh, at Canberra in Australia, didn't you? I did my master's in Canberra in Australia and then uh, came back to Singapore after that. I worked for seven years as a military, as an instructor in the Singapore Armed Forces, uh, teaching strategic studies to, um, 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 to senior officers. And when the opportunity arose, I joined the Rajaratnam School and, and went to Aberystwyth, which you know about, uh, where I did my PhD. How do you find, I mean, coming from Singapore, you know, small country, Southeast Asia, and then doing a lot of your studies in places like Australia and the UK, I mean, how does the perception, uh, if you will, differ about security, the nature of security, how you study security, you know, from Singapore to Australia to the UK? Oh, it's very, very different. Um, a lot of people tend to forget that Singapore is a very, very very small country. The main island is about 700 odd square kilometers in, in, in size. Um, from east to west, it's barely 50 kilometers as the crow flies. From north to south, it's barely 30 odd kilometers again as the, as the crow flies. It's very, very small. And when it's that small, um, and you, when you don't live in a country like Singapore, it's really difficult to get your head around the strategic issues that a small country like Singapore would face. Um, it's almost inevitable, I suppose, that, that, that uh, policymakers in Singapore have this almost psychotic sense of vulnerability, uh, precisely because we're that small and everybody else is so much larger than us. Mm. Now, originally, I mean, there were all these, these, these quite um, colorful notions that were developed um, through different generations about how Singapore would conceptualize this defense. And I think one of the earliest ones was poison, poisonous shrimp, wasn't it? I do believe. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, what's um, how, poisonous shrimp and how do we relate that to Singapore's sort of small size or sense of vulnerability? Well, the shrimp is obvious. Um, po why poisonous shrimp? This was in the early days of Singapore's existence and more importantly, the early days of the Singapore Armed Forces. Uh, they didn't have a lot of capability. Um, the founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew was the one who came up with that notion of a poisonous shrimp. Because he said, you know, it's in, in the world of international politics, Singapore is like a poisonous shrimp. Now, everybody eats shrimp, but if you're a poisonous shrimp and somebody eats you, well, bad things happen to you after that. Possibly you die. And as long as you recognize that that particular shrimp is poisonous, you maybe want to think twice about eating it. At least that was the idea that underpinned um, um, the notion of the poisonous shrimp. Mm. The problem with the poisonous shrimp, of course, is that it's inherently defeatist in nature. You acknowledge that if anybody wants to eat you, they will, poisonous or otherwise. Um, so you acknowledge that you're going to be defeated one way or the other. Your country is going to be devastated. But you basically hope, in the words of one particular scholar, to impose a Stalingrad-style defense of the island on, 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 your, on your opponent. Which was why, in the in, sometime in the 1980s, the image changed. All of a sudden, Singapore became a porcupine. Okay, so from poisonous shrimp to porcupine. So then it may be perhaps less defeatist, in a sense, that the porcupine's quills... Or in the case of uh, oh, yeah. Singapore, high-tech weaponry will sort of deter opponents? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. So the idea, that, uh, the, the idea of, the, of, of the porcupine is that 
when the porcupine doesn't feel threatened, where the porcupine starts and ends is pretty clear. But when the porcupine feels threatened and it rustles its quills up, where does the porcupine now begin? Is the po does the porcupine begin with its actual physical body or does the porcupine begin where at, the, at the pointy end of the quill? Um, that was the idea. So the idea, therefore, in the porcupine was that Singapore would be able to defend itself, uh, as it were, a little bit further afield than its actual borders. Um, so if you, because Singapore is that small, this idea that we had no strategic depth, so the idea was, in, in, in the case of the porcupine, to create, as it were, an artificial strategic depth by engaging your opponent some distance away from the actual shoreline of Singapore. Mm. Um, but by the late 1990s, the image again once, uh, once again changed. By the late 1990s, the Singapore Armed Forces was talking about, was depicting itself as a third generation Singapore Armed Forces. And along the way, there was the recognition that the analogy had to change. Um, you're a third generation Armed Forces. Um, you're much more capable than ever before. But there was also this increasing idea in, in, in Singapore about possibly engaging in soft power instruments to make Singapore look a little bit more attractive. A porcupine clearly isn't a very attractive animal. So the idea came up that we should become a dolphin. Uh, we should live, survive and prosper on our intelligence, on our wits, uh, on our speed and our, uh, and our agility. But at the same time, possess the capacity to bite anything that tries to attack us. Okay, so some poison shrimp to porcupine to dolphin. Okay, <coughs> interesting. Yeah. I don't know what the next animal is going to be. Okay, <laughs> interesting. I mean, one of the things that's interesting with Singapore is that, uh, I mean, again, small country, sense of vulnerability. But on the flip side, you know, with the exception of the confrontation way back in the 1960s, you know, Singapore hasn't been really sort of directly involved or threatened, in a sense, uh, in, in a war. I mean, how, how, how does this also affect sort of security perceptions and planning where, in a sense, the military hasn't had to sort of be involved in a sort of high-tempo, sort of kinetic war, uh, and it's sort of planning sort of virtual threats, in a sense, or threats that maybe are, haven't actually manifested itself? I mean, well, how does that dynamic work? Well, in the first place, um, in the early days, Singapore had one particular vulnerability stemming from its stemming from its geography and that was the lack or the insufficient amount of potable water to be found on the island itself um, about 70 percent of drinking water in singapore at that point in time came from across the causeway north of singapore from malaysia and singapore had signed two water agreements with the government of malaysia back then lee kuan yu therefore spelt out the scenario in which he thought he would have to use the Singapore Armed Forces in a high-tempo kinetic operations uh, uh, manner. And the scenario was this. Somebody would turn off the water tap from, from Malaysia. For whatever reasons, they would turn off the water tap. And for a number of reasons which are too complicated to go into, the Malaysian government will either be unable or unwilling to restore water supplies. At which point in time, Lee Kuan Yew uh, acknowledged in his memoirs, he would have had no choice but to, sing, but to send the Singapore Armed Forces in into Malaysia to restore the water supply. That was the key vulnerability more than anything else. And there have been a number of occasions in Singapore's history of relations with Malaysia when Malaysian politicians, um, whether junior or senior, have made public noises to the effect that you know, Singapore's being really difficult with us, so maybe we should turn off the tap after all. Mm. Um, that has always been something that rankles with, this, with the Singapore poli policymakers' mindset. Uh, another thing that tends to stick in their mind is the point of separation from Malaysia. Um, at that point in time, there were two Malaysian battalions occupying military facilities in Singapore. Interestingly, the two Singapore Infantry Regiment battalions were not stationed in Singapore at that point in time, but were participating with their Malaysian comrades against, in the confrontation against, against Indonesia. So at the point of separation, the two battalions were ordered to withdraw north of the causeway back to Malaysia because they're no longer uh, um, 
situated in Malaysia proper. One of the battalion commanders took it upon himself to say, no, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to arrest Lee Kuan Yew. Um, at which point in time, of course, command and control kicked in and said, no, you're a soldier, you have to obey orders, come back to Malaysia. And he did. But these are the kinds of events that sort of stuck in the mind of our policymakers, and it continues to inform, um, to a very large extent, the security narrative in Singapore that we are always very small, we are always very vulnerable. Our relations with our two immediate neighbours, Mal uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, have probably never been better before. But we cannot rule out that possibility of things turning sour. Yes. Um, we're going to have a short break for a couple of announcements. We'll be right back, uh, continuing our conversation with Dr. Liu in about one minute. Welcome to ThinkTechHawaii.com. This is Johnson Choi, your host. The topic is Asia in Reveal. We do it on a monthly basis on Thursday at 11 o'clock. Be sure to check the schedule. See you. Aloha, I'm Chantelle Seville, host of the Savvy Chick Show on Think Tech Hawaii. We are very excited to launch Mission Savvy Chicks that will be here to help young women and girls achieve their dreams. Once a month, I'll be interviewing a special feature Savvy Chick to share her mission or dream. If you're a Savvy Chick with a mission or a dream and you'd like some assistance, I'd love to have you on my show. Be sure to write into Think Tech Hawaii or the Savvy Chick Show and we'll see you soon. Aloha, I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Hello, welcome back to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton. I'm talking with Dr. Bernard Liu from RSIS in Singapore. Before the break, Bernard was discussing a lot of the history of sort of uh, security perceptions from the Singaporean perspective with a lot of colorful analogies that are used in Singapore from poisonous shrimp to a porcupine to dolphin. One thing I wanted to ask Bernard about today is, I mean, kind of constantly here in Hawaii in the U.S. and I, I think in a large portion of Asia, People are focusing on the South China Sea and a lot of developments. And Singapore sort of sits on this very strategic location, you know, on the Malacca Straits, uh, in the sort of center of, South, of the South China Sea, one could say. Um, one of the things from Singapore, I mean, what's sort of the viewpoint, uh, if you will, in Singapore about sort of these rising tensions in the South China Sea these days? Officially, this, the Singapore government's view will be to um, want to address the problems in the South China Sea in, most importantly, a non-military a non manner, uh, a, a diplomatic manner. They want uh, the problem to be solved as much as possible. Um, ASEAN and China have committed to a declaration uh, towards uh, an agreement for an incidence at sea uh, mm. um, 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 kind of mechanism. Um, and there's going to be, um, uh, and they've committed towards the establishment of a code of conduct in the South China Sea. Singapore remains fairly committed to this idea that the code of conduct needs to be formalized, except that up to this particular point in time, there is no actual code of conduct, uh, unfortunately. Um, that's officially the Singapore view. I don't know if you followed the very, the, the only very recently ended um, China ASEAN Foreign Minister's dialogue in which it ended supposedly without any sort of statement. Um, the Malaysian government, the Malaysian Foreign Minister initially issued a, a fairly strongly worded statement, but that was quickly um, 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 retracted and a, and a new statement was, was, was issued. Um, Singapore's Foreign Minister was chairing that particular meeting and he was expected to give a press conference at the end of that meeting, but instead he flew back to Singapore. Um, officially, the reason was that he had something he really needed to attend to, so he could not attend to that particular uh, uh, press conference. And I don't know whether you want to read too much into that particular event, therefore. Unofficially, I suspect what the Singapore government will tell you is that they are deeply concerned about what about the developments in the South China Sea, um, the construction of the artificial islands, um, the United States and its and its partners conducting all of these freedom of navigation operations, the number of close incidents that have happened between American 
uh, 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 um, either vessels or aircraft on the one hand uh, and their PLA counterparts on the other. All of these things, um, all of these things are not particularly welcome from the Singapore uh, policy makers' perspective. One thing that often is remarked about uh, sort of ASEAN states is that you've got certain ASEAN states that are sort of sort of on the front lines, if you will, of this sort of um, territorial dispute with, with China. So Vietnam, the Philippines have a certain perception about China and their concerns about China. Other Southeast Asian states, you know, have been much more, um, they seem to be much less concerned or they're trying to have a more balanced or a more non-conflictual uh, sort of way of handling, particularly, say, Indonesia and Malaysia in the past. Um, do you see those, are things shifting? Are Malaysia and Indonesia seeming to be a little more concerned than they used to be, say, five or six years ago? Or are they still pretty, you know, hey, you know, that's the Philippines, that's Vietnam, we're not going to react to China the same way? Well, the in Indonesia, technically speaking, uh, is not a claimant right. to the South China Sea issue. Malaysia is a partial claimant. Um, so clearly Malaysia has some stake in that particular game. Um, what the Malaysian government had been trying to do for a very long time was to sort of play their cards in a much more careful manner. Um, they clearly did not want to antagonize China and they were almost going out of their way to try to be positive in their relationship with China, particularly when it came to this particular territorial dispute. But over the last couple of months, um, the tone from Kuala Lumpur seems to have changed. Um, the tone seems to be increasingly, you know, we try to play nice with you, but this is the thanks we've got. Um, there are some analysts in Kuala Lumpur who are now arguing that um, the Malaysian stand has to become a little bit more, um, shall we say, or a little less friendly, a little less accommodating. Um, Indonesia has found that, well, the South China Sea, in a sense, does affect it, in particularly when you come to the Natunas Islands. Yes. Um, and Indonesia also wanting the maritime nation, especially under the current president. So all of these things, I think, have pushed both countries towards, I don't want to say a confrontational stand towards China, uh, but they're definitely starting to adopt a slightly more hardline approach towards the whole territorial dispute. But you're right, there are other countries in Southeast Asia that in a sense don't have a bone in this particular fight. Um, Thailand, for instance, has absolutely no interest in, in this particular dispute, nor does Cambodia, nor does Laos, or Myanmar for that matter. And if you look at the long history of these particular countries, you find that geopolitically they've always tended to orientate towards the mainland, towards the the, uh, the country that's north of them in this particular case china so um they've tended to be a little bit more friendly if you want to call it uh, towards china at the same time however they also recognize i think that china holds certain cards against them potentially if you look at the mekong delta for instance and the construct and the idea that a number of dams are going to be constructed on the headwaters of the mekong for hydroelectric purposes, the electricity that, that's supposedly going to be generated by these dams, China says it's going to share with all of these particular communities. But it doesn't take genius to see that the construction of these dams on the headwaters of the Mekong is going to affect everybody else who live further downstream. Um, Thailand already is starting to feel those particular effects. Laos and, Cam Laos and Cambodia less so. So for these countries, on the one hand, they've tended to tilt towards China for a number of reasons, but at the same time, they've also recognized that China potentially holds certain cards against them. Mm. When it comes to the South China Sea, therefore, these countries will most likely, I think, um, at the very least, take a no position stand on this issue. In a sense, this is also dovetail with the, the traditional sort of... Um how should we say, uh, modus operandi that ASEAN likes to be in a sort of non-interference sort of, um, I, I don't want to say neutral, but um, sort of a stance that ASEAN tends to have that some people criticize because ASEAN tends to not be the most, say, decisive uh, regional organization, if you will. It's not that it's 
not the most decisive of regional organizations. The problem with the ASEAN modus operandi is that, number one, you're right. There is this idea of non-interference. We're not supposed to comment on each other's domestic issues. Um, and if one particular country says that, I'm not sure I agree with everybody on this particular issue, we're supposed to take a, a, a step back and say, okay, um, tell us when you're ready. So there was always this idea of not just non-interference, but also this idea of letting you develop um, a, a, a common understanding at your own pace. Why is that important? Because that's the second part of the ASEAN op modus operandi, consensus. The idea was that we will never make a decision as ASEAN unless all 10 members agree. Um, and that was very, very important. But if you have a region which in a sense is really two, two regions, geographically speaking, one region, very maritime in nature, and that's countries like uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, but an, another set of countries which are much more, in a sense, continental in, in, in their perspective, and that's the Indo-Chinese countries, with the possible exception of Vietnam. Um, it doesn't take a strategic genius to see that consensus is not always going to be very, very easy to arrive at. Mm. ASEAN also, sorry, but there's a third problem with ASEAN uh, and its modus operandi. And it is this notion that when it came to security issues, they wanted, ASEAN wanted to be in the driver's seat. So if you take the ASEAN Regional Forum, for instance, this includes great powers like China on the one hand and superpowers like the United States. ASEAN insisted that it was going to be in the driver's seat. It was going to drive the agenda. Again, you don't have to be a genius to see that that was always going to be untenable. You are only going to drive the agenda in the ASEAN Regional Forum as long as the great powers allow you to. Mm, okay, interesting. interesting. Uh, I wanted to maybe shift the, the conversation maybe from outside security to inside security. Um, the reason I asked this question is last year I, I had an event where I was interacting with people from Malaysia and from Indonesia. And for, for a lot of these guys who were security professionals, military professionals, the big security issue for them was this the specter of sort of people who've gone off to fight for ISIS and might be coming home and then engaging activities uh, back home. Is there a similar security concern in Singapore uh, uh, about that, uh, people who may be volunteered for ISIS and then coming back? It's not just people who volunteer for ISIS. It's also people who decide that they want to fight for the other side, for the anti-ISIS uh, community. Uh, a couple of months ago, a Singaporean national um, was arrested on the on the basis that he had intended to go to Syria. He had intended to go to um, 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 Turkey to join the 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 the, the, the Kurdish uh, Peshmerga. Mm -hmm. um, he had brought. He's a Singaporean male, which therefore means because we have conscription, a um, military, uh, military service. He had brought his military equipment with him, and he was going off to Turkey to join the Kurdish Peshmerga. He was arrested subsequently. So we are very concerned about this, about 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 this particular set of developments where people are going off towards these conflict zones, um, acquiring a, a whole series of skills which we don't expect normal. Uh, 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 ordinary citizens to have, bringing them back and bringing those particular problems back with us. But it's not a recent phenomenon. It's something that's happened in the past. There were, an, there were a number of Southeast Asians who, during the war in Afghanistan, the Soviet war in Afghanistan, went off to Afghanistan to, 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 to fight alongside um, 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 the Afghan rebels. Um, when the United States invaded Afghanistan, uh, again, you had a number of Southeast Asians who decided to go there to join the Taliban. Um, it's an ongoing problem for us, not just Malaysia and Indonesia, but in a sense also Singapore. Thailand also has that particular problem because remember, um, the southern provinces of Thailand are predominantly Muslim in, in, in population. And the same problem therefore goes for, for the Philippines because southern Philippines is again predominantly Muslim. So you've, we found people in, 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 in this arc of instability, as some people call it, who have either gone to Syria, gone to Afghanistan, or are entertaining the idea of going towards these kinds of conflict places.
Does this, because all of these nations um, are sharing the security concern, does this provide a window for perhaps enhanced security cooperation between countries that sometimes have tensions in, in other relations? Does this provide a venue for Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and so on to sort of cooperate on this issue? Because they, they share sort of a mutual interest? Oh, definitely, definitely. A few years ago, a Singaporean national who had been arrested under the Internal Security Act on the grounds that he was um, uh, an Al-Qaeda an Al affiliated terrorist um, managed to escape from his prison. Uh, he managed to not just escape from the prison, but he also managed to elude the attempts to re recapture him. Eventually, through a process of intelligence sharing with Malaysia, between Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia, he was located in Malaysia. Um, and once he was located in Malaysia, the Malaysian authorities took over, they mounted an operation and recaptured him. Kept him in prison for several months before repatriating back to Singapore. Mm. He's currently back in Singapore in a prison and presumably this time the prison authorities have learned from their past mistakes and he won't escape again. Good, good, good. All right. I so think there are all these security mm -hmm. cooperation measures. Okay, good. Um, I think that's about all the, the time that we, uh, we have today. Um, uh, but I'd like to thank you, Bernard, for coming in and uh, speaking with us. I know it's a d time difference there to you back in Singapore. What time is it over there? Right now it's 7.30 in the morning. Okay, you've got the whole work day in front of you then. That's excellent. <laughs> Thanks, Pat, for this opportunity. Oh, thank you very much, Bernard. You have a good day there. You too. All right. All right, well, thank you very much. I'll see you guys next week. I'm Patrick Bratton on Global Connections.